first of all, my apologies for the, for the delay. Um, but I'm very happy to have uh, Venkat with us from a digital creation center who's going to give uh, a presentation about uh, research data management. I hope we'll be able to follow this with a presentation by Thomas Margoni from uh, CREATE, uh, the Copyright Center at the University of Glasgow. Um, so, but he has he had some troubles with the sound, so we're hoping to try to, to get this fixed while we're having this first webinar. If you have any questions um, for Venkat, um, you can just, uh, there is a Q&A button, button at the bottom of the screen, and you can just enter your question there, and at the end of the presentation, we will go through each of the questions and try to see if we can find the, if we can find an answer. So if that's okay for all of you, uh, then um, Venkat, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Ben Katt. So I work for the DCC, the Digital Curation Center, which is based uh, mainly in uh, Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, just a quick background about us. Uh, we were established around 2004 and we work at a national and international level. Um, we deal with um, consultancy and training and policy making and advocacy in digital data management. Uh, so the best practices and also on the other flip side, as well as the researchers, we um, deal with the people that actually provide these services and how to build those services or improve them. Uh, we also are involved in international consortia, uh, schools and projects, uh, lots of EU funded projects, including open air. Uh, and one key thing to remember is that we do all of what I just said, but we're not actually um, actively doing any data curation, although the name Digital Curation Center might uh, give a different impression. Okay, so um, I'm going to take you through some basic tools um, on how to better manage your data. Um, and to start off, I'm just showing you this slide from uh, a nature paper, which uh, was only from 2016. And um, in this, they did a survey of uh, 1,500 or so uh, researchers to find out if there were, they thought that there was a reproducibility crisis. And interestingly, more than half of them, uh, the respondents actually said that, yes, there is a significant crisis in reproducibility of published um, research. So this immediately raises a, a problem and this is what uh, we're trying to address here. The other question that uh, you may see is why make data available? And I think this slide, I think sums it up quite nicely for me that it was never acceptable to publish papers without making data available. And so we are talking about publishing data and not actually peer-reviewed papers here. So when we talk about data publication, we're talking about in repositories uh, and other means. Something that you'll probably encounter a lot and maybe you already have been taught about is the FAIR principles. Um, this is a, quite a recent thing, um, only in the last few years. Um, and it's something that is trying to be pushed quite a lot in uh, EU funded projects as well as um, globally. And in case you don't know, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And what I'm going to show you in the subsequent slides will hopefully address many of these points. Um, if you don't understand what all these words actually mean, if English isn't your first language, then hopefully we'll be able to uh, clarify later in the Q&A. And also you can uh, find out more about these FAIR principles from um, this publication that was uh, just from last year. I should point out that these slides will be made uh, available to you and the links that are shown in these slides will be, um, you'll be able to find these documents. And uh, a final breakdown of what those, um, each of those uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable things mean. So, uh, some common misconceptions about the FAIR uh, principles is that um, the data needs to be made open. Now, 
although I said in just one of the earlier slides there that uh, data should be made open, um, this is only when you should, you're actually able to. Not all data can be, and the FAIR principles do acknowledge that. Maybe there's uh, data of a sensitive nature, and of course, in those cases, it might not be possible to actually make it open. Uh, they don't uh, actually particularly specify any technologies or implementations, so it is more of a, a wide scope, wide ranging scope of um, principles. FAIR is not a standard to be followed or a strict criteria. It is a spectrum, um, so that yes, we are trying to be accommodating as possible. And it, it doesn't only apply to the life sciences. And I say that because it originated from the life sciences, but now it encompasses um, the full gamut of research. So just to tie that all together, what we're seeing here is if you have this overall large um, circle, which shows managed data, fair data is essentially a subset of that. And Meanwhile, you have open data that might not be managed in any particular way, but which um, can also overlap with FAIR and managed data. And what we're trying to do here is to increase this overlap between FAIR data and open data. And you will hear this um, saying many times uh, in your RDM travels, uh, as open as possible and as closed as necessary. So the rest of the talk will actually now focus on the actual uh, nuts and bolts, the actual um, how you go about uh, practicing good research data management, that's RDM. So when we talk about data here, we typically talk about uh, a life cycle. So from the point that um, a piece of data is created all the way through to its preservation. Now this life cycle that I'm showing here is our uh, version of it, but you might actually encounter other versions too that have different uh, terminologies. But we typically break it down into six nodes here, creation, documentation, usage, storage, sharing of the data and preservation. What I'm going to do now is go through each of these steps and uh, show you some practical um, things that you need to do. So for creation, data creation tips, um, we encourage people to use uh, consent forms um, and licenses and agreements don't restrict the opportunities to share that data. Choosing appropriate file formats, adoption of a file naming convention and creation of metadata and documentation as you go. So just going through those, um, consent forms. Now, this seems like uh, something that you may not think is valuable, but it is, um, especially obviously if you're talking about sensitive data. But even when you're talking about non sensitive data that um, doesn't require any um, permission from anywhere, uh, you should do this. A consent form is required by many repositories. So when you're thinking about the long term and when you're uh, going to actually eventually deposit your data into a repository, most repositories will actually make sure that you have consent to actually use and deposit that data. So from the outset of your research project, make sure you use a consent form. Choosing appropriate file formats. Now, this again seems like a very trivial thing, but Let's actually take it um, step by step here. When we're talking about file formats, we typically are talking about open file formats for good research data management. Now, there's a difference between open file formats and what we call proprietary file formats. Proprietary file formats are such things as you might find as uh, Word files, um, Excel sheets, and so forth. These are uh, specialized file formats for specialized, usually commercial uh, software packages. But say in a hundred years time or so, you wanted to make sure that that uh, data that you've deposited is still accessible and readable in some way. It might be that the uh, file format that you're using 
uh, if it were in a word format might not be readable anymore because that software package doesn't exist anymore. Now, of course, in this, this case of Microsoft products, it's highly unlikely that's the case. But if there are other file formats that might not uh, survive the test of time, then you need to be careful. So for text documents, we typically uh, recommend that people use uh, .txt files, for instance. Um, the other thing to remember about uh, open and proprietary file formats is um, the use of lossless file formats as well. So lossless meaning uncompressed, basically. So when you, for instance, are talking about images, if you're looking at JPEG images, which are very widely used, these files are actually compressed. Now, if you're doing some research and doing analyses on some images, for instance, you would want to actually do the analysis on the uncompressed or lossless file format. That's because that contains all the data that was captured. And of course, when you're doing analyses, then you want to make sure that you have the full set of data. Breaking this down, um, this table here has been um, adapted from the UK Data Service, and you'll be able to access this um, uh, slide when I share it. But you will be able to find many tables like this uh, by doing simple Google searches. This table shows you um, the different types of data that you might encounter and the preferred uh, recommended uh, file formats and the acceptable file, file formats. So again, using image data, for instance, you can see that the recommended format is TIFF file. So this is an uncompressed file format, an open, whereas acceptable but uh, ones that you should uh, avoid if you can are JPEGs, and um, other file formats there, like pings. And so for different file, uh, file types, uh, whether they're text or audio or video, you have these recommended and acceptable file formats. Organizing your data, again, seems like a, a very trivial thing, but you do need to keep uh, aware, be aware of how you are uh, doing your file naming conventions and your directory structures, especially if you're using command line or Unix um, uh, operating systems, this can be a very powerful way of uh, allowing better analyses and faster analyses. If you have a standardized way of naming your files and folders, then you can do command line operations, for instance, which allow automation. Um, so again, just following these simple rules is very key. I'm going to move on to the next two here, documentation and usage. So documentation, again, seems very trivial, but uh, think about what is needed in order to evaluate, understand, and reuse the data. Why was it created? How have you um, documented, and what, did you, and what did you do, and how? Apologies. Did you develop code to run the analysis? And if so, this should be kept and shared too. Important to provide a wider context for trust. And this goes back to this idea of uh, reproducibility and trying to uh, stem any kind of uh, research fraud. So what is metadata? Now, this is a word that you will frequently encounter in research data management. And it is essentially a subset of documentation. Um, it is something that is machine and human readable and is standardized and structured. It helps to uh, cite and disambiguate data, meaning to allow uh, knowing what any particular data or data set is um, from another one. So some metadata standards that you might encounter are ones that are more generalized in scope, such as Dublin Core, and other ones that are more discipline specific. And these are a few examples right here. But if you are starting a project, one of the, the first things that we recommend that you should do 
is try and find out if there's a metadata standard that fits your particular field of uh, research. And these two links here actually uh, take you to some catalogs of uh, known metadata standards that already exist. Um, and which uh, you should um, try and find some metadata standards that you might be able to adopt. Moving on from that, the, another uh, thing that we encourage people to do is use controlled vocabularies. Now, to uh, try and describe this, I'm using this example here where um, this is an actual uh, use case where a group of researchers were asked to describe the subject of an actual experiment. Subject meaning who is being experimented on or uh, analyzed. They were asked this uh, to just describe it using free text, meaning they could just write or type it in the answer. And this was the um, list of answers that were uh, given. So looking through this list, I hope people can see that actually what they, all the respondents said were actually the same answer. They're talking about humans, except they've actually written it in different ways. H. sapien, homo sapien, etc. Now for us as humans ourselves, we can read that and we can actually see that they are all the same answer. But for a computer, that isn't the case. It cannot actually um, figure out that they're actually the, one and the same thing. So by using controlled vocabularies, we can actually uh, get rid of this problem. Meaning, um, for instance, in when you uh, are filling out a web form, for instance, you might get some drop-down menus which have some pre-written um, uh, options. Those are controlled vocabularies. One step beyond uh, controlled vo uh, vocabularies are ontologies. So these are uh, controlled vocabularies, but now they are structured, meaning that you usually will find um, parent-child relationships. So for instance, in this slide, I'm uh, showing two different trees. Now, just looking at one of these trees, you can see that, um, for instance, term B1 is a child of term A3. So these are different controlled vocabulary components, but now um, structured into a tree. The double-headed arrow shows that what you can do here in a computational sense is that if you have two different trees of ontologies, one for one organism and another for another organism, if you were to try and do some kind of search, um, searching between the two trees, these trees could uh, conceivably have thousands upon thousands of comp uh, different components. Um, now, if we were trying to do that searching between the two trees manually, that could be very difficult because you are trying to do, um, you have so many different terms. However, for a computer, this could be done in literally seconds because it, it can actually process this information so much quicker. That is the power of using ontologies. Now, we again recommend that uh, you look for a um, ontology if possible for your field of research. And on the slide, we have this um, uh, link to a catalog that you can hopefully find uh, a suitable ontology. It may be the case that you will not find one, but we recommend that you at least try to look. Going on to storage, where will you store the data? Again, it seems very trivial, but uh, make sure that you um, store your active data, meaning when you're doing your analyses um, in, something, in an area where um, there is backup of, of that information. Don't um, only keep your data in laptops or flash drives, etc because if you lose those or they break down, 
then you will not have any way to recover that data. We recommend using departmental or university servers. Um, many universities have provision for this. If they do, then please do use those. The other option is to use cloud storage, which is becoming more and more prevalent. There are third party tools that you can use for collaboration, of course. Um, these are very widely used like Dropbox. Uh, and there's another option called Own Clyde. And here at the University of Edinburgh, where uh, the DCC is based, um, we have our own systems that have been um, built on Own Cloud, for instance. Um, but using these uh, kind of services, these commercial services like Dropbox or Google Drive, uh, do be careful. These are commercial options. And again, if we're talking about sensitive data or um, any kind of data breaches, then you need to make sure that ownership of your data um, is actually addressed. Preservation and backup, not the same thing. And this is something that uh, some people do get confused about. Uh, backups are regular, um, uh, regularly done and maintained, uh, whereas archiving of data and preservation is usually what you do at the end of the, the life cycle. And it's for long-term preservation. Sharing of uh, the data, this generally means um, licenses. So in the FAIR principles, um, the R stands for reusability. And this is typically where we are talking about um, licenses. So one of the most widely used licenses that you will encounter are called Creative Commons. Um, and when we say uh, most common, I'm talking for research data. So this table here shows what the different Creative Commons licenses are and um, what level of openness that they, they provide. So typically when we are talking about open uh, data, then we are asking people to make it public domain or use this CCBY um, denotion here, uh, which the BY means uh, to attribute. The more uh, closed licenses are the ones that you see further down here, CCBY and CND. I'm not going to go into each of these uh, step by step, but please do go and um, look up the CC um, Creative Commons licenses, which you can easily find online. And when you are uh, wanting to apply a license, uh, there are ways to do it if you don't know the most appropriate license that you want to use. Uh, and this tool here, for instance, can help you out, uh, which will take you through a wizard and it will ask you questions on, on your data and it will suggest a suitable license for you to use. Finally, in the preservation stage, what we're talking here about is typically repositories. Now repositories are, um, can be both institutional or uh, discipline specific. Now, a place that uh, you can find uh, suitable repositories are in this um, catalog called re3data.org. Again, you'll be able to access this uh, when you get the slides. So we, recommend in many cases that when you are starting off your project that you actually look for a, a suitable repository first. This is actually a useful way of doing things because if you can figure out if there's a suitable repository for your data, then that actually uh, addresses many of the questions that um, we were discussing just previously, including metadata, ontologies, and licenses. So using this catalog, you can find a repository, hopefully. Um, we recommend that you try to find something that is domain or discipline specific, um, because this actually adds value uh, to your data. The more that you um, 
keep your data with other data of a similar nature, it increases the usefulness because any kind of cross comparisons between the data um, make it more valuable in, in that way. If you are only able to deposit into a more generalized data because maybe your research is so um, different to anything else out there and there is no discipline specific repository, then your data does become somewhat diluted in amongst other data types. But unfortunately, um, in those cases, there's not much you can do about it, perhaps, unless you were going to uh, build your own repository. But of course, that could uh, involve a lot of time uh, and money and effort. Um, check they match particular data needs, formats accepted, mixture of open and restricted access. Uh, you will also encounter this notion of uh, persistent and globally unique identifiers. So something that you probably have uh, already uh, encountered are digital object identifiers or DOIs. Now that's one particular type of persistent identifier. Excuse me. Many repositories will actually um, provide unique identifiers for any uh, data that's deposited. Not all of them, but many do. And this is actually something that uh, you should look out for. The final thing perhaps to look out for is look out for trustworthy digital repository. Um, this means that that repository has been um, accredited by an independent body. This might not always be possible, but uh, do look out for that. So yeah, um, just finally uh, mentioning the persistent identifiers. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, PIDs come in various forms. I described DOIs. You'll also encounter ORCIDs, which are for uh, individuals as researchers. Of course, ISBNs for books and so forth. Typically, they're actionable, meaning that um, if you were to type the ID into a web browser, then it will be resolved. And many repositories will assign them out on deposit, as I previously mentioned. So that's the end of my presentation. And I'm going to take questions if there are any. And um, hopefully, <laughs> Thomas will be able to join us as well if he's not already. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Venkat. Uh, and um, again, my apologies for putting you on the spot, but I think, uh, <laughs> I think you, you, you did great. So uh, if there are any questions uh, from you for Venkat, feel free to send them either in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay, so they, they already, um, there's one question in the Q&A. I don't know if, you've, if you see this. Um, um, yeah, okay. Yeah. But maybe we can read it out loud. So yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll read it out. Yeah, sure. Okay. Sorry, I, I started to cough at the end there. I apologize. <laughs> um, so the question is, having a lot of different repositories and archives, however, seems to have two drawbacks to me. A, due to the fragmentation to different databases, uh, the findability will certainly be hindered to a certain extent. And B, research cons a uh, consortium may put data in multiple repositories, making the, the workflow sticky. Okay. Um, yeah, so we would ask or uh, recommend that you, you stick to one repository. Um, when you finish your research uh, project or when you've finished with any particular data or data set, that's when you're going to uh, deposit your data, of course. Um, try not to fragment. You, you are absolutely right. Um, try to find one repository that um, you can actually deposit your data in. If you do end up putting it into more than one um, repository, then it, it's not that it's not allowed. It just makes things more complicated. So yes, I agree. Try to stick to one repository. Um, 
research consortium may put data in multiple repositories. May, um, unless you know of specific examples that, where that is true, then I'm not sure that is actually uh, true. So maybe you have um, particular experience or examples of this, but I, I'm not so uh, aware of that. Okay, I mean, I've just uh, got another reply there saying, I mean, you have three different universities in an EU project. Any of the unis has its own repository. Okay, where, where to fit the project data? Um, yeah, okay. So it depends on, on the, the policy of the, the university or the institution, I, I admit. Um, there might be... Uh, local uh, meaning the the institution has its own policy uh, that needs to be um, adhered to. Now in that case, if you are in a consortium or uh, some kind of pan-European project, then you should, this is something that you need to discuss from the very start. Try and establish that um, you will use a common repository perhaps because that is the solution there. Um, unless, if, if that is not possible, then I'm afraid you will have to live with uh, depositing into multiple repositories, but hopefully that's not the case. Well, of course, thank God, like aggregating services like open air should make this a little less sticky and a bit more seamless, seamless as well. But, uh, but that might not always address the yeah. question whether a local policy, it's yeah. which one is more important basically. And unfortunately, maybe some institutions um, make that a priority, but they, it's this idea of ownership of data. Okay, so there's there's another follow up question. All oh, right, this, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't yeah. sorry, there's another question saying, wouldn't it be better to have the EU forcing Horizon 2020 projects to use one central repository? Yeah, um, <laughs> the the problem here is this idea of forcing. Um, I would somewhat agree, but. Um, it's better to try and persuade people rather than forcing people to follow these, these, uh, these ideas. Um, and that's, I think, the, the thing where the EU stands with, with the way that these projects are funded. They don't want to enforce any kind of particular um, solutions onto the researchers yet. We are, you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. we are talking about standardization, but leave consortia alone with the choice. Yeah, um, I agree in many ways. Yeah, we, we're trying to persuade people. It's a, we're trying to make a culture change here. That, that's essentially the part. Um, we need to try and encourage people to follow these principles and um, hopefully that will happen. And it is happening, believe me, it is. Um, but we want to allow there uh, to be enough room for uh, consortia to be able to make their own uh, choices. I don't know if there's anybody from EOS Cup in the audience who might be able to uh, elaborate a bit on the role, potential role of EOSC in this process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm looking. I'm see, looking if I see any familiar names, but not immediately. Feel free to chat, shout in the chat. So, do you want me to go to the questions that were written before? Uh, oh yes, please. Yeah. Um, let me just find those. Um, I, <clears throat> I can. I can. Hold on. Yeah, I've got them here. Okay. Can you hear me? Ah. Oh, look okay. who's there. Good, great. <laughs> I just thought to use this short uh, pause to check whether I fixed the audio issues. <laughs> oh, perfect, Thomas. 
Uh, then we will just we will just finalize the questions. For yeah, Venkat and I, mean, then I can, can I can start. go to these uh, these questions um, that Gwen emailed to me. Um, these were sent before this webinar started. Um, so I'll just do you mind, Thomas, if I just quickly go through these? Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So. The first question was, what is the human and financial cost of RDM? Um, so that's a very good question. Of course, um, we typically say that maybe 5% of the budget of any given project should be uh, put towards um, proper data management. Um, it will just depend, of course, depending on the project, because some, some projects might produce vast amounts of data, others might not produce anything, in fact. Um, and it needs to be just taken um, in a case-by-case -case manner. But on average, we, we, we seem to think about 5% of the budget should go towards that. Um, the next question was how to choose the best repository, is any file format or file naming. It's, hopefully I've addressed that already. Will Plan S also affect the publishing requirements for research data? Um, I actually don't know the full answer to this, but I, I'm, you know, I'm not the best person to ask about this, so I'm not going to say any more. Um, how do academic libraries participate in the RDM to provide users information needs? So again, that's a very good um, question. And it will just depend on your host institution, perhaps. Um, they need to be uh, involved. Certainly the, the librarians should be involved in um, building the infrastructure of your host institution's um, RDM infrastructure. And this is something that uh, we at the DCC actually do by going to many different institutions around the world and actually assessing uh, what the needs are uh, at that institution and helping the librarians, the um, IT professionals and the research officers um, to actually come together along with the actual researchers themselves to build uh, RDM in infrastructure. Um, since Hor Horizon 2020, uh, focused on innovations. Do you have any feedback about how project partners from industry and other privately funded entities perceived open data? Were there any legal concerns, especially on intellectual property rights or some embargoes on opening the data? I think I might leave that to Thomas. He might actually have more uh, a better answer to that question than me. Um, next question would be interested in hearing more concerning the use of data from social media and research, especially in terms of sharing and ownership. Um, okay, that is a great question, especially with uh, what's happened with Facebook and other platforms, perhaps. I'm afraid, uh, again, I, I don't have enough knowledge there of this. Um, Next question, I would like to hear about working with data sets within RDM systems and also about the role experiences of academic librarians in this part of RDM. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer there either because uh, you would really need to speak to your local librarians perhaps. Um, Working with data sets, yes, certainly uh, as a researcher, uh, a librarian should be someone that you can turn to if you have established good training um, protocols in your institution. They are the people that researchers should be able to turn to, to find out how to create data management plans, uh, find out about repositories and other things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, specific examples, it's beyond the scope of this webinar. What's your recommendation for future applicants to universities to Horizon projects from what key thing to do and not to do when writing dissemination and communication activities? Um, 
I think the, the key thing here um, for particularly Horizon 2020 projects is to create a data management plan. Again, it's beyond the scope of this webinar, but uh, you can find out lots of information about Horizon 2020 projects and data management plans, DMPs. It, if it's something that you've not um, learned about yet, uh, please do just do a simple search for data management plans and Horizon 2020, and you'll be able to find out more about that and also templates that you can use to put together a DMP. Uh, and finally, what's the best and most efficient way to store your data? Okay, I, I, hopefully I've addressed that in my actual slides. So okay. um, I'm going to shut up now <laughs> and uh, hand over. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. Um, I just want to make use of this, uh, this little uh, interval to just to point you to a couple of uh, resources that are also created by OpenAir. So if you go to openair.eu slash guides, you will find quite a lot of uh, guides and fact sheets and resources that are linked to both, uh, both the topics of Venkat's presentation as the one from, uh, from Thomas's. So feel free to take a look there and, and, uh, and browse around. Um, but that being said, um, I would suggest, uh, Thomas, that, um, that we try to uh, start your presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can hear me, right? I can yeah. hear you fine. Okay. <laughs> so everybody, this is uh, this is uh, Thomas Margoni from uh, Create, uh, which is the department of the Glasgow uh, University of Glasgow that uh, deals with copyright issues. And uh, Thomas is going to talk about um, so yeah copyright and legal issues related to research data management. And I think he's also going to address uh, ownership issues, right? Um, yes. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. At least uh, these are very complex. Uh, issues um, and uh, I really hope that uh, we'll be able to do this in a understandable and not excessively, excessively tedious way. Um, you can see my slides right now? No, not yet. I think you'll have to share again. Yes, okay. Now? Yes, okay. yes now we see it. And yeah. it, it's fine or do I have to full screen it? I think you have to full screen it because now we see your, your navigating mode. Okay. Mm. No? Yeah, still, still navigating mode. Yes, this is full screen, perfect. It's full screen? Okay. Um, and uh, should I talk for about uh, 20 minutes in order to keep uh, uh, interest high and, uh, and, uh, and um, the time within a manageable uh, amount, let's say? Is that okay? Yes, 20 minutes is fine. I mean, you can, you, we can go a bit over time. So we started late, so it's okay. Yeah, no, I just, you know, I don't, I, I, as, ho, as um, often happens uh, with legal analysis, if you're a lawyer, you find it extremely exciting and interesting. But uh, over time, I think that uh, we kind of discovered that this applies only to lawyers and other people find it extremely, extremely boring. So also for the sake of uh, um, this, uh, lawyer effect i'll try to be as uh, as um concise as possible um so yeah well thank you very much first of all to to everyone to um gwen for inviting me or, and organizing these activities uh thank you also to venkat for a very interesting presentation and sorry for the uh initial um problem with my audio so I will um, go over some of the issues that actually Ben had mentioned because uh, I, I found his presentation extremely inspiring. But I do think that he, and I do think he has identified a couple of uh, uh, basic concepts that are the reason why we have problems with data from a legal point of view. And one of uh, these concepts, the first one, and the, the, the aspect that I focus most of my, my research attention is precisely that of data ownership, which is a very strange and to some extent a recent uh, concept, because if we look at the area of law that traditionally regulates, uh, let's say, information property, well, one of the basic assumptions is that 
data as such is not really protected. What is protected is uh, an original expression. So the usual example is um, um, a plot about uh, a doctor who goes mad and creates a monster um, that uh, you know it's looks like him and uh, eventually will you know underline the philosophical tension between uh, human you know human condition and and creating life. Well, this sorry everyone can do that. You know this is an idea. This is not protected. Now, if you start using the expressive form that Mary Shelley did then uh, or any other author then uh, there it's the area where um the form of so-called property but also here we have uh, uh, some clarifications to make is that of copyright copyright doesn't protect data that doesn't protect uh, basic information doesn't protect facts doesn't protect any of uh, these aspects why well because uh, they are the basic bricks of our knowledge mm -hmm. Um, the reproducibility crisis that we were mentioning shouldn't, unfortunately, shouldn't be too surprising once we notice how much within uh, um, research we have switched to a model where data has an economic value. And obviously, if it, is, if it has an economic value, then the closest tool that uh, the law offers you is some form of property. So there are often these uh, associations, oh, that's my data, when the truth is that, uh, you know, it's not really your data, it's uh, simply some basic information. And uh, international uh, conventions in the field of copyright uh, um, and allied rights usually clarify this aspect. Only your original expression, the output of your uh, ingenuity, the um, the original, the choices that you make, only this aspect can attract protection, but the basic data, no. Um, which doesn't mean that uh, there are no forms that can offer some sort of proprietary protection to data, but then what is protected in these cases is not uh, the uh, data themselves, is not the single datum and it's not uh, any form of uh, data aggregation, but we have specific legal requirements that tell us that, you know, this data, it's protected if it is constructed in a specific databases. So there needs to be some sort of methodological or systematic uh, arrangement, etc., etc., etc. I will not enter too much into these legal details. We have guides where we try to, some of which uh, um, Gwen showed us just now, some others I have in my slides. Um, and I, I refer you to those guides uh, if you want to have the legal details. But I think that the main message that is, is important to understand now is, you know, data ownership is uh, the enemy of reproducibility. Because to the extent to which you have to ask for permission to use someone else's data to some extent, then you are creating barriers to this uh, reproducibility. And this is a, a first main uh, uh, aspect to keep in mind. The fact that data as such is not protected and should not be protected has really to do with basic freedoms, such as freedom of uh, scientific research and freedom uh, 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 of information and, and of speech. And this is quite clearly stated in international conventions. In Europe, we're a bit peculiar in the sense that uh, we decided to offer one additional layer of protection to data, the famous or uh, infamous Swai generis database, right? And in that case, you do not need uh, creativity. You need a substantial investment in collecting, verifying, or presenting the data, but not in uh, creating it. Once again, all the information necessary is in the guides, but the main problem here, it's the same. You do not want as a legal system to favor forms of property over information because this limits basic fundamental freedoms. And uh, again, if you impede uh, the free flow of information, if you condition it to specific uh, 
uh, barriers, if you create transactive costs to that, then these are the spaces where data, uh, sorry, the repro reproducibility crisis uh, or reproducibility issues um, arise. And now after this nice uh, statement, uh, I basically am telling you exactly the opposite. So what has happened over time, it's that you, you have to imagine that copyright laws, most of them have been written 200 years ago. Now, back then the attention was on mostly books, maps, songs, data didn't really attract much of an attention. Um, all this relevance uh, on, on the role of data, it's certainly uh, the result of the last, uh, you know, what, few decades, few years of, uh, of uh, data analytics uh, developments from uh, text and data mining to machine learning, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a legal system that was designed uh, to protect uh, knowledge 200 years ago with minimal updates had to um, offer some sort of answers to modern questions, questions around data. And whereas the main principle survives, data as such is not protected, it turns out, unfortunately, that uh, um, at the end of the day, you have to ask so many permissions because uh, sure, the data as such is not protected, but uh, um, because you need to make a copy of almost any support uh, where data is uh, saved, then uh, almost always, not always, but very often, um, you have to make a reproduction of, for example, a database and that is protected and then you need to ask for permission. So there are this kind of mismatch between what is the basic legal principle and what is the applicability uh, of the law to a specific case. Now you can perhaps connect uh, this, uh, hopefully not too abstract, uh, um, scenario to the debate that we had around tax and data mining and on whether we need a tax and data mining exception or the right to read it's the right to mine. Um, this two, um, this dichotomy I would say mirrors very well this tension that I just explained to you. Of course the right to read is or should be the right to mine, right? While if I read something, um, I don't need uh, permission, but uh, if I do that through uh, a tool called the computer, then I need permission. That doesn't make too much sense. But unfortunately, there is so much legal uncertainty in this area that uh, at the end of the day, uh, just you know, in the opinion of uh, the majority that approved uh, the directive, it made sense to have a specific exception. So the text and data mining exception that allows you to do certain things with, uh, with data. But this is also an implicit uh, um, acknowledgement that, well, you know, we could say that uh, data as such is not protected, but at the end of the day, a lot of, uh, the ways or the forms in which data is uh, stored or contained or saved or presented, well, those forms are protected. So we are kind of surreptitiously denying those basic principles of you know, free flow of data and creating some legal barriers. The other aspect that um, um, before we, I spend a few words on uh, uh, the Article 3, so the text and data mining exception, which has been approved and should enter into uh, force over the next, now I think, one year and uh, eight months. Um, I want to mention another aspect that uh, Venkat identified in his presentation, but I will not go into the detail, uh, into the details. From the point of view of a researcher, that it's data. So whatever the legal impediment, uh, this is not, uh, you know, it's, I guess probably rightly so, it's not something that should bother the researcher. Um, whether you can do or don't, you know, or you cannot do a certain thing, um, it's the uh, question that really matters to you. Whether the reason why you cannot do it, it's uh, grounded in copyright or personal data or freedom of information or 
uh, public sector information or contracts or technological protection measures, this becomes a bit more of a secondary issue, I would imagine, to many researchers. Unfortunately, from the legal point of view, we couldn't be um, we couldn't be on two limiting our analysis to corporate and personal data uh, more far apart in terms of what are the principles, what are the reasons, what are uh, the aspects that we want to protect. So many of the things that uh, we can say about data ownership look at a certain area of law, but when we talk about personal data, we are looking at a completely different area of law and uh, the tools, the permissions, uh, the kind of activities that you can or cannot do um, work on a completely different uh, um, basis. Um, within open air, um, we have uh, a task force where um, a colleague of mine and I are working on these two issues. Um, I am focusing, as probably have inferred at this point, on uh, the copyright and proprietary and ownership issues, whereas the colleague who probably you know, Prodromos, he focuses on uh, uh, the data protection aspect. Uh, I will not say much more about data protection for this reason. I don't know if Prodromos is giving a, a similar talk uh, within uh, the Open Access Week, but certainly the guides uh, that Open Air has prepared cover both copyright issues and uh, privacy or data protection issues. So very briefly on the tax and data mining exception, first uh, uh, basic clarification, certain member states have implemented a tax and data mining on their own, um, the UK, for example. But because this was done within the old European framework, all these tax and data mining exceptions have to be limited to non-commercial purposes. Whereas the European tax and data mining exception, Article 3 of the Copyright and Digital Single Market Directive, the directive has been approved, but um, in the last April. And since the publication, member states have two years to implement it. So member states are right now in the process of implementing this example. So this is probably something that you don't have right now today at your disposal, but it would become available very soon. And it will be the big advantage. It would apply almost in the exact way across all the, at this point, I don't know, what to say if 27 or 28 countries anymore. Um, so that's a big advantage also for the issue connected with big, large consortia, uh, which sometimes have to follow different uh, national legislations. In this case, uh, Article 3 would apl will apply in a very, very similar way um, everywhere in the EU. And uh, Article 3 did some good stuff. So the definition of text and data mining, it's, uh, it's uh, I, I, I skimmed through it quickly. It's uh, broad enough to cover almost any data analytics. Uh, literature hasn't found a big problem here. The scope, unfortunately, it's quite limited. It's limited to the right of reproduction. So you can make a, a, a um, small copy, for example, of a database uh, if you want to extract uh, uh, data, but you cannot uh, uh, communicate or, repro or sorry, or distribute that copy any any further. Um, this should be contrasted, for example, with what is the situation, say, in the United States, where fair use uh, says that these activities are transformative; they create uh, added value. So we don't have, for example, this limitation to their production. You can do whatever you want. We, you can communicate your results to the public on the basis of the, of, uh, the EU solution, well, if your results are a production in part of the original, in theory not. So you see that uh, we have a big problem here. Uh, beneficiaries, again, uh, uh, the EU solution limits uh, the availability of this uh, um, exception to research organizations uh, for research purposes. Probably many of the attendees of today's uh, webinar belong to one of these uh, organizations. But so that's probably, you know, less of a concern. But we have to keep in mind that here we are cutting out uh, all 
um, one could say, well, you know, the commercial sector should pay for it. Sure. Uh, but we're cutting out also all the startups and uh, small uh, and medium enterprises. Uh, and the difference is that, you know, incumbent players do have the money to pay for, um, let's say, a license, whereas startups don't. So this uh, uh, condition that at first sight might sound reasonable at the end of the day has the consequence of marginalizing further uh, the new entrants in the, in the data analytics field. Um, whereas the big ones don't have a problem with that. Um, and again, this I understand it can get a, a bit technical, but the good thing is that if you're doing text and data mining for this matter, either under, let's say the UK exception or the future U one, and the terms of use of the website say you cannot do this. Uh, for example, the terms of use of the website say, uh, by reading this website, by accessing this website, you accept uh, the terms and conditions, uh, which no one and never reads, but uh, at some point in article 23.1.6.8.44, it says uh, you cannot text and data mine. Well, that provision, uh, it's void. So this is a good thing. However, if the same effect, you cannot data mine, it's done to encryption, then, well, the discourse becomes a bit more complex, but the general answer is uh, you have a problem. Uh, I'm happy to discuss this further. I don't want to go into the details because it can get uh, quite uh, uh, technical. And uh, again, um, I find it extremely exciting, but perhaps, uh, you know, I'm the only one here. Now, the good thing of, uh, uh, or apparently a potential uh, good thing of the exception, it's that it created in its uh, latest version, a new article that allows everyone, so you see in point number three, it's all, not only research organization, to perform text and data mining. Uh, however, in this case, right holders can limit contractually. So the famous clause 4.3 uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, under article four, it could be enforceable. So then again, you see, uh, there is always this tension between uh, um, openness and, uh, and uh, non-openness uh, in, uh, in this specific area of uh, data and data ownership. Again, if this sounds uh, uh, complicated or you know tedious, uh, well, that's understandable. You're not uh, alone out there. We tried to create a few guides, uh, and uh, here I reported the main guides uh, that we developed with OpenAir. This focus, as I said, uh, on uh, uh, copyright, uh, um, ownership, uh, and uh, reuse. So. Uh, Venka earlier on showed some uh, licenses, Creative Commons. So here we have a bit of uh, um, an analysis, uh, what you can do, what you can't, uh, how can you combine different licenses, for example, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm sure that the slides will be available. Um, so feel free to you know click on these guides, have a look. Hopefully they are easy enough to understand. Um, and you know, if they're not, please let me know. So this is uh, in extreme summary, my presentation. Um, I think that uh, the main message is that uh, surprisingly and probably also um, deceptively to some of you, data it's uh, not uh, and should not most importantly um, be owned. Um, and uh, for how much you can feel a strong relationship to your data, because I don't know, maybe you have spent the last five years collecting it. There is a much larger public interest uh, um, need there that uh, um, wants, that requires that data to be open. Obviously we're not in a you know, black and white situation. No one will uh, oblige you to disclose all your data uh, immediately before you have had the opportunity, for example, to verify it or to, you know, perform a number of activities. But, you know, these are uh, our details if we compare them with the problem connected with the fact that uh, 
we think that data should be owned and it's like to say that ideas should be owned that if you think that uh, you know the idea of uh, i don't know a flying object it's good well then it's yours then no one else can build airplanes and i'm afraid that in the case of data we're only starting right now to understand the uh, far-reaching consequences of these uh, uh, assumptions that we are we are making so hopefully the application of open science principles also to the field of ga of data will guide us in the right direction thank you very much thank you very much uh, Thomas for this uh, very interesting presentation um, let's just briefly I'm, I'm, I'm not going to uh, have this Q&A for too long because we're, we're going a bit over over time but I would just like to refer back to the two questions in the list that, that we put in the chat um, that Vankat referred to you because um, the one the one question was whether any legal concerns uh, when it comes to IPR um, um, with uh, private partners and industry. I don't know if you have any any um, feedback on that from Horizon 2020 partners. Well, you know, do you have any insight? There. Sorry. It, it's you know it's a huge question and usually when uh, when you sign a, a GA there is a specific section dedicated to IPRs and uh, the IPRs that already exist within one entity and whether those uh, should be considered owned or not owned by that entity and what happens if uh, part of those IPRs are reused by a partner but there really, um, it, it, uh, it depends on uh, what you write in that uh, grant agreement. So um, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not aware of whether there should be, and if there are not, it's something that probably should be done, um, a guideline or you know, a, a best uh, practice on how to write that uh, uh, clause. Unfortunately, here we are always in the same situation. Um, you, as a researcher, it's usually not you, but it's your uh, TTO or you know grant team mm -hmm. at the university who writes uh, that uh, that clause. And they're what uh, you know that their job, you know, if they want to do this job well, they have to protect their employer. So they normally apply a very restrictive clause. You know, everything that belongs to the University of Glasgow belongs to Glasgow and it's ours and, and you cannot reuse uh, unless it is specifically authorized. Um, and I agree again, sorry, I keep citing Venkat, but I agree with, the, his, uh, with his statement when he said that we're trying to change the culture here uh, much more than the law. I mean, this question that you just uh, reported, is, it's not as much a, as a legal question as it is a cultural question, because honestly, it depends on what you want to write in that clause. Um, if we understood that, uh, you know, should uh, universities funded with public money really own the uh, IP on what they have produced? Well, you know, there is quite clear, um, in the literature, there are, there are clear cases uh, showing that, you know, it's inefficient to recognize this. Uh, IP rights. Sure, every now and then, you know, if let's say that the IP right is a patent, uh, you hit the jackpot and you make a few millions. But the truth is that the general cost to um, managing and administering all these uh, IP data largely outweighs the uh, advantages of uh, um, exploiting uh, um, IPRs from a university point of view. Uh, but then again, uh, this is not actually the you know direction where many universities uh, um, okay. are moving. Um, obviously, it has to do with bigger questions connected to public funding, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I think I would stop here. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question was about social media, but maybe I'd, I'd propose that we refer that question to Prodromos. I'm correct that he would be the one there's a couple um, of questions um, in the Q and A um, window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to get to them. I just wanted to make sure that we covered all the questions that people send yeah, in beforehand. Yeah, so the one ones, sure about the use of data from social media and research, uh, especially in terms of sharing and ownership. So, Thomas, do I understand you correctly that um, that, that that would be a, more a question for Prodromos Tiavos? 
if you have well, a webinar with him? What data, right? Um, yeah. If it is uh, personal data, um, yes. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not that I refuse to even consider <laughs> personal data issues. I do have a working knowledge of those. Yeah. Um, but the guides have been written by him. But don't get me wrong, a lot of, I mean, even when you, I don't know, when you do some uh, site scraping of uh, Twitter or, you know, whatever other website, you, you know, what you want to, to acquire data from, um, there are two types, the data that you are obtaining could be personal data, if mm -hmm. they are personal data, meaning that they, they identify or could identify uh, an individual, let's say an email, age, then in this case, you have to look at uh, um, data protection issues. Um, and yes, consent is, so the, the main thing of data protection of the GDPR is that it tells you that you need to use, uh, to have a legal basis in order to reuse that information. Um, and the consent is certainly a very important legal basis However, it comes with strings attached in the sense that consent can be withdrawn. So, you know, you acquire consent, but in, you know, one year and a half, uh, uh, someone writes you and tells you, please, you know, I, I'm with, uh, withdrawing my consent. You have to eliminate the data that applies, that relates to me from your database. In that case, you have an obligation to do that. Uh, it has to be specific. So it has to be specific for a, specific, for a purpose. So if you acquire consent uh, because you want to, I don't know, analyze uh, uh, social interactions, uh, you cannot reuse the same data for a different consent, for a different purpose, such as analyzing, uh, um, I don't know, biological interactions, if this means anything. Um, I'm making up examples. But the problem of consent is that it has to be specific for a purpose. And it has to be time limited. So, you know, you have to indicate uh, the time um, and at the end of the time you have to delete it. So what we do in the guides is um, actually um, identifying situations where the, you know, uh, different legal bases uh, operate better for you. Sometimes, depending on the situation, but again, I refer you to the guides, uh, a different legal basis other than consent may apply, may offer uh, advantages to the kind of activity that you're doing. So in this case, uh, for example, a legitimate interest or uh, the fulfillment of a contract, uh, they may offer you uh, a different uh, set of opportunities or limitations. So this is something that cannot be answered in general. It has to be uh, analyzed in the light of the very specific situation. And then again, the data ownership or copyright aspects are completely different. Um, one would need to see what the uh, terms of use of that specific website say, and uh, if they limit or permit uh, uh, certain data analytics, you have to analyze whether depending on the jurisdiction where you are, there is a mining exception that applies to you, whether it is uh, limited to specific uh, scopes, whether it is uh, uh, limited to specific uh, entities, or whether uh, it is limited to specific type of uh, uses. And then again, you know, you have to, to be to almost develop a case by case analysis. There is really no other way out. But what we're trying to do with the guides, uh, um, I'm sorry that I keep promoting the guides, but I really think that one of the uh, main uh, contributions of open air in this specific field, it's trying to standardize a set of common um, issues that uh, researchers might encounter and offer uh, answers to these type of situations. They won't be as uh, you know detailed as uh, your individual situation. That's simply impossible, but hopefully they will get as close uh, as you know you can get. And you can use those guides when you go talk to your technological transfer office or to your university um, grant team and show them that uh, 
um, you know, the guide says something uh, else than, you know, the usual default disappointing answer. So maybe again, this can help uh, change the, the, um, the cultural approach in this type of issues. Okay, thank you. Um, before we close, I'd like to uh, go back to the Q&A. Ben, ben knows because there are like two rema three remaining questions there. Um, the first one is one by Sebastian Lange, who um, basically makes a statement, uh, not really a question. Uh, I'll just read it so that you, you see it all. Uh, the idea of science is also that it arises from itself, but it's not dictated by a sub sub superordinate political organization. Even it would be nice to have a uniform structure, structure is always a constraint on science, especially when it comes to measurability. As there is no, no re not really a question there, I'll take the liberty of, of going to the, next, uh, to the next question, if that's okay. I'm sorry, Sebastian, but we're running out of time. Um, there's a question for Thomas by Petra, um, again, related to the ownership of data. So how can you explain to patients that their data cannot be owned by them? I don't know if you want to comment on this, Thomas. I think you already partly answered this in your previous comments. Yeah, it, it really depends on the data, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it really depends on the, on the whether these are if, if they are if they are uh, personal data, meaning that they identify the individual. Well, ownership is not the right word because ownership means property and. Uh, if you own something, you can sell it, whereas you cannot sell your personal uh, data. You can do certain things, but not others. So it's not ownership, but there certainly be uh, a connection between uh, the, the, it's like, you know, you, your personal data are an extensions of your personality. So, but you wouldn't say that you own your personality. I mean, there is some sort of attachment between you and your personality but it's not something, you know, you can go at the market and then and buy or sell it. So ownership is not the right term here. Uh, there is certainly a power to control, um, but only to the extent to which a certain, uh, certain data are identified or identifiable. Um, because uh, otherwise uh, there is, uh, you know, this balance that you have to make between public and private and say, well, you know, um, combining and uh, linking all these uh, gigabillions of no, zettabytes, right, of, of data can uh, help uh, finding new, you know, discoveries. So that's a good thing. Okay, so uh, let's leave the, the, the final question. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's to be expected and I'm surprised that we kept it at bay for 90 minutes. But the question is what will happen to EU research data stored in the UK after Brexit? Uh, for example, from research projects in which a number of universities from different EU member states participate. Which law applies, UK or EU law? Um, I don't know, thank God, uh, um, Thomas, you're both based in the UK, so um, I don't know if you want to, if you both want to. Uh, I would say that here. largely depends on, uh, you know, what, what will the law say? So right now there is a negotiation of a, you know, this called deal withdrawal. Um, yeah. I would imagine that it doesn't go <laughs> specifically, you know, in this very scenario, but probably indicates something on the future relationship between UK and, uh, and the EU. But then again, uh, you know, it's also a matter, don't expect that the law can offer you every single answer to your question. <laughs> certain other things uh you know there are certain things that are not regulated by the law but maybe by contract so is there yeah, an agreement I, to which you uh, store the data in the uk what does the agreement say can you get it back you know again it really depends on the on the on the details uh, yeah i agree uh, it's too early to say i think but um but if it's eu funded research then I think the, it'll be very difficult for the UK to uh, block access. Sorry, yeah, I was just going to finish there. <laughs> okay, well, 
let me finish uh, the entire webinar <laughs> up to that uh, to that cliff uh, slight cliffhanger. Um, so <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, Thomas and and, and Venkat for um, agreeing to talk here. I think it was uh, both of, both of the webinars were very interesting. Uh, again, my uh, our apologies for you, the audience, for the slight technical problems uh, at the beginning, and uh, thank God to you for making you rush <laughs> through your presentation because I, I communicated the time wrong. Um, all of these presentations and recordings will be put online. Uh, they will be put on the Open Air YouTube channel on uh, the the Open Air webinar pages. Uh, we'll also distribute them via social media and you will also receive one email from us next week with an evalu evaluation form and uh, if uh, there we will also link to all of these recordings. So uh, you'll definitely get them um, somewhere in the next uh, somewhere in the next week. It might not be uh, today or tomorrow, but uh, rest assured they'll, they'll be they'll be there. So um, then uh, have a nice afternoon, I'd say, and I would. Uh, I'm hoping that I will see some of you back uh, in one of our next uh, webinars this week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.